So what is Missions Month? Because I know that we've got some new family, and I'm very cognizant always that, you know, we can come into these kind of months and we go, yeah, everybody knows what Missions Month is, but not everybody knows what Missions Month is. So Missions Month is a month where we get to highlight just some of the incredible people that we get to work with across the globe. They're more than just people that we get to work with. They're our family across the globe. So over the course of this month, you know, through um, our Sunday services, through social media, through the website, you'll get to see a, a number of people that we get to partner with. And then next week, um, it, it all culminates in our missions offering. And why do we take up a missions offering? Well, we take up a missions offering once a year. Once a year. And that once a year is to support all these beautiful people. The people like Pastor Nathan Lakisi, uh, The people like Pastor Frank and Gladys, who... By the way, on Saturday, thank you guys for praying because they emailed me and their visa came through and we will have Pastor Frank and Gladys all the way from India with us on Monday night. So next week and, and for, for missions offering, which is so incredible. It's such an answer to prayer. So this is why we do what we do in missions offering. So what I wanted to speak on this morning really speaks the heart of City Impact Church towards missions offering, but more so it speaks the heart of Jesus towards us being a, a people who outreach, who, who look at ways to embrace outreaching um, as, a, as a culture, as part of life. So I want to read a passage of Scripture that I have preached on before, but I love it because it sums up Jesus' heart on missions outreach. And so I'm going to start in Luke 10, verse 25. It says, Just then the religious scholar stood before Jesus in order to test his doctrine. He posed this question, Teacher, what requirement must I fulfill if I want to live forever in heaven? Jesus replied, what does Moses teach us? What do you read of in the law? The religious scholar answered, it states, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your passion, all your energy, and your every thought. And you must love your neighbor. Everybody nudge the person next to you as well as you love yourself. Jesus said, that is correct. Now go and do exactly that, and you will live. Wanting to justify himself, he questioned Jesus further, saying, what do you mean by my neighbor? Jesus replied, listen, and I will tell you. There was once a Jewish man traveling to Jerusalem, to Jericho, where bandits robbed him along the way. They beat him severely, stripped him naked, and left him half dead. Soon a Jewish priest was walking down the same road. He came upon the wounded man. Seeing him from a distance, the priest crossed to the other side of the road and walked right past him, not turning to help him one bit. Later a religious man, a Levite, came walking down the same road. And likewise, he crossed to the other side to pass by the wounded man without stopping to help him. Finally, another man, a Samaritan, came upon the bleeding man who was moved with tender compassion. He was moved with compassion for him. He stooped down and gave him first aid. He poured olive oil into his wounds, dif disinfecting them with wine and bandaging him so the bleeding would stop. Lifting him up, he placed him on his donkey and brought him to the inn. Then he took him from his, uh, from his donkey and carried him to the room for the night. And the next morning he took his own money from his wallet and he gave it to the innkeeper with these words. Take care of him until I come back from my journey. Church, Jesus is not yet back from his journey. We've got a very, very clear mandate. If it costs more than this, I will repay you when I return. So now tell me, which one of these three men who saw the wounded man proved to be the true neighbor? The religious scholar responded, the one who demonstrated kindness and mercy. Jesus said, you must go and do the same as he. Powerful, powerful parable. Powerful, powerful store, story. Powerful account where Jesus you know, answers the question for us all this morning as to what he expects of us in our life. But let's remind ourselves of the scholar's question. His first question was, what requirement must I do to fulfill my entry into heaven? What a, a sad and disappointing question. If that would be the sum total 
of all that his uh, religious or faith experience was. What box must I tick to enter the kingdom of God? But unfortunately, you know, that can be the sum total of people's faith journey. And missing out on this Christian adventure, this Christian life, which is so fulfilling. And Jesus helps a scholar with another question. Uh, sorry, he helps him with this question. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your passion, with all your energy, and with every thought. And you must love your neighbor as well as you love yourself. To which the scholar replied with another question. Okay, so who is my neighbor? It's a good question. So Jesus then launches into the parable, and I've got a bit of a helpful sermon illustration coming up. So Jesus launches into this story. He says, there was a Jewish man. And this Jewish man was on a journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. And the scholar goes, oh, I know that road. That's, that's that narrow, rocky road. That's, that's a very dangerous road. And as the Jewish man was walking down the road, the Bible says, and Jesus says, some bandits yeah you thought I was a nice pastor <laughs> some bandits came across him and left to, and beat him so badly that he was half dead and the scholar's like what the injustice that's my fellow Jew but Jesus goes on he says don't worry there was a priest That was walking down the same road, and the scholar's like, wow, awesome. The priest, he's a good man. He's a man of the cloth. Yeah, he's going to help this man. He's going he's to help the fellow Jew. But then Jesus kind of floors him. He says, as, as the priest comes up to him, he... <laughs> you like that sidestep? He sidesteps him. Purposefully sidesteps him and walks around him. And the, the scholar's like, what? No! That's the priest. That's the man of God. How, how, how can he leave him? He's going to die. But Jesus goes on. He says, no, don't worry. There was a Levite. Hi, oh, a Levite. Awesome. They're the guys that actually serve in church. They're like the ushers. Production team. The worship team. They're fine. He, he'll help them. But Jesus says this as the Levite saw him from afar. Oh man, I'm getting better every time. Sidesteps him and walks around him and leaves the Jewish man to bleed out. But now the scholar's like, man, this is hopeless. He's going to die. But Jesus adds a third person. He says, but don't worry, along came a Samaritan. Samaritan. As soon as he mentioned the word Samaritan, the, scholar, the scholar's blood begins to boil. It's like, oof, Samaritans hate Jews. Jews hate Samaritans. Surely he's going to die now. But Jesus floors him with this. He says as soon as the Samaritan saw him, he sidesteps in towards the Jewish man. And he leans down. And he starts to giving him first aid and there's no mouth to mouth on stage. <laughs> starts to giving him first aid and he starts to pour wine on his wound and oil into the wound and lifts the, the Jewish man up. Pray for me. Puts him on his donkey. Is Coach Dave in here? Coach Dave, that's for you. <laughs> Takes him to the inn. Carries him to the room. Says, I'll be back. If there's any more money, you, you take care of him and, and I'll, I'll be back. Thank you. Everybody give your hands. Put your hands together for Jason. <laughs> Let me catch my breath. Yeah, I'm still catching my breath. So 
So what would cause the Samaritan to sidestep into the trouble instead of sidestep around the trouble? But Jesus says to us, and he says to the scholar as he finishes his parable, because the, the scholar's like gobsmacked, he's like, I have to do what he's done. He says, go and do likewise. As we, you know, gather around mission outreach offering, that's the, the cry of heaven. That's the cry of Jesus. Go and do likewise. We all have an opportunity to either sidestep away or sidestep in towards the opportunities that Jesus puts before us. And in this parable, Jesus describes three kinds of people. He describes the priest, he describes the Levite, and he describes the Samaritan. And he starts off with the priest. He says, oh, well, let's just see, what do we know about the priest? Well, we know he was a fellow Jew, right? He was a fellow Jew. He was walking the same path. That's what the parable says. He was walking down the same path from Jerusalem to Jericho. They both started their journey at Jerusalem. They probably could have even known each other. They could have grown up together in the same school, in the same temple. They could have worshipped side by side. He was a priest. He was an upright, trusted figure. He was schooled in the scriptures. So he would have read all the scriptures of God's heart towards the poor. He would have known them. He held a position of significance. He was probably a really good person. He saw the dying man from afar. So why did he sidestep outside the path of the need? Was he too busy? Did he have an important deadline to keep in Jericho? Was the dying man a distraction to his schedule? And before you start to throwing stones and casting stones, because I know sometimes we can read that and go, oh, the priest. How often can we fit ourselves into that category? Too busy. Next week's too inconvenient to come to mission offering. It's too, too inconvenient to fast, to pray. We can go, we can fit into the category of being too busy. Too busy makes it really hard for us to love our neighbor. Then he introduced the Levite. So what do we know about the Levite? He was a fellow Jew. He also started his journey in Jerusalem and was heading down the same path to Jericho. Again, they could have known each other, could have grown up together, could have gone to the same school, the same temple. He was a, he was a Levite. Therefore, he was known as a reliable man. He served in the house of God. He had temple duties. He held a position of responsibility. He was probably a good man. He saw the dying man from afar. So why did he sidestep around the need? Again, before you go throwing stones at him, what was going through his mind was that, that the man would probably def, could possibly defile him. If I, if I go in to help him, what if other people see me? You know, what if other people know that I give to church or give to these people that I don't even know? All these kind of questions that went around possibly in the Levite's mind are the same kind of questions that could go around in our mind. I trust that we would not have this thought that, that, that maybe he for a moment thought, well, the man probably deserved it. Yeah, that's a sobering thought, but what was going through his mind? I had the pleasure of interviewing Pastor Frank this week. And in the interview, we were talking about the work that he does in the leper colony. Right? He goes to a leper colony. Hands up if you know what leprosy is. Okay, so in India, they have these leper colonies. And the lepers don't typically go outside of this colony. And no one comes in because they're seen as the dirty people. But in talking to him and Pastor Gladys, I asked him, why do you go? He says, if, no one else go, if I don't go, no one else will go. If no one else goes to feed them, you know, what's, what's their hope? And in India, the climate's already bad enough. <laughs> you know, the caste system, you know, he's already seen, you know, as, as, as low caste himself. And then going in to help these people 
that no one else wants to touch. But yet there's the heart of Jesus to go and do likewise, to go and do likewise. So Pastor Frank's a busy man, and I know it wouldn't have been a popular decision. It may not have even been popular for his congregation that he was seen to be going and helping the lepers, yet the lepers was the need. Overthinking, overthinking makes it really hard for us to love our neighbor. And perhaps the Levite was, fell into the trap of overthinking. Then Jesus talks about the Samaritan. So what do we know about him? He wasn't a Jew. He was a Samaritan, obviously. And Jews and Samaritans had strained relationships. I think that's a, probably the nicest possible way. Say goodbye to our school kids. They're going to get ready for the school open day. Have fun, guys. If you're wondering why they're walking out, I didn't say something to offend them. <laughs> they had strained relationships. They both started their journey in Jerusalem. But this is the thing that I found interesting. Jesus doesn't say, and you can go and read this parable again, Jesus does not mention, like he did with the priest and the Levite, that he was on the same path. So what caused him to sidestep in instead of sidestep around the need? What caused him to do that? It's kind of like the secret service agent. I was just talking to Lyndon as we went out for a walk this week. And um, this kind of sums it up, you know, like the, the secret service. You've heard of the secret service, right? They were in action this week, I think, trying to guard the queen. And um, the secret service, they are trained to go and insert themselves into the path of trouble. They have what they call a zero, uh, zero, what do they call it? Zero, zero, zero fail mission, zero fail mission, all throughout their training, all throughout their college, all throughout their experience to get into the secret service, and it's quite an effort to just get selected to get into the secret service, but all through their training, they keep drumming into them, we are on a zero fail mission, we are on a zero fail mission, in other words, we throw ourselves into the line of duty regardless. The Samaritan, kind of in my mind, paints that picture of Someone who's willing to throw themselves in towards the inconvenience, in towards the path of trouble. There could, for all we know, the, the bandits were possibly still around. That was the, the nature of this road. But he didn't stop to look at his, you know, look behind him or take, you know, you know any regard for his own um, self. What's the word I'm looking for? Preservation. Thank you. Pastor Joe, self-preservation. No, he went straight in to the path of the need. He embraced the challenge. My question to you as we prepare for missions offering next week, are we prepared to insert ourselves into the need? Are we prepared to sidestep in to the need rather than sidestep around the need? Towards the path of the kids in Philippines, I want to show you a few videos from last year, which, uh, such beautiful videos. But are we prepared to actually sidestep our way into the path of these children in Philippines? Thanks, team. The bugs would crawl up my legs. You couldn't stop them. We were used to the mud and dirt, but the worst part was the bugs all over me. I go to kids' church in Talgum City. The nice people have built me a brand new building to learn about Jesus. Before this, we can sit under a tree, outside in the wind, and sometimes even rain. This is where the bugs are. If it rains too hard, we squeeze inside the pastor's living room. It will dry, but very small. Now, I can't believe the amazing things we have at my kids' church. My friends and me, we say that we are rich, the richest kids in Targum. God is good. Coming here is my favorite part of my week. Now, I just wish that other churches could have what we have. 
So the kids in Philippines, they're part of the need that lies before us as a church. Will we sidestep in towards it or sidestep around them? The people in Nepal and remote villages, they're, they're also part of the, the need that we are so, you know, that we are stepping in towards. So thanks, team, for the next video. The day after my auntie died, I met a man who believes in Jesus. His name was Bishnu. I asked him to pray that God would bring my auntie back to life. All the people in the village gathered around. Vishnu leaned over her body and prayed out loud. Nothing was happening and people started to jeer and walk away. But then the strangest thing happened. My auntie's body began to writhe and cough. And then she stood up. People stopped leaving. In fact, they turned around and crowded in. Vishnu led almost 300 people in my village to Jesus that day. Now I've heard about other villages, witch doctors turning to Jesus, medical clinics being built, churches being constructed across the country so people can worship God together. And now, just like my auntie, it feels like we are being brought back to life. Isn't that awesome? We just finished building our seventh clinic in Nepal with guys like Pastor Bishnu, who we just heard about. These are the kind of people that we have the benefit as a church family of stepping in towards, you know, this mission outreach time. And I want to present to you again the, the work of Pastor Frank and Gladys. They're another, uh, you know, just a heroic couple that campus pastor 48 campuses in India that are, that are pastoring in some of the most hostile conditions that you or I could even imagine, and raising all these beautiful children in three orphanages, will we step in towards the needs in India this mission offering time? Sometimes Pastor Gladys will just come back to the children's home with brand new clothes just for me. I remember the fresh smell as I put the sari over my head and hugged it close around my shoulders. I can remember feeling like I was valuable. I never felt that before. When I lived on the street, I didn't have anything that was new. I was forgotten. I was nobody. People were ashamed of me. I was just another outcast. When this time where I was loved, wearing these new clothes, I felt like a real person, a new person. And I felt for the first time in my whole life, someone cared about me. And then Pastor Gladys told me that I was a child of God and that he is a good father that loves making me feel new. Isn't that beautiful? I was talking to Pastor Frank in the interview and we started talking about the widows that he, that he supports. And on his birthday, December the 24th, Many years ago, he started, God placed on his heart to support some of the widows. Again, knowing the caste system over there, the widows were considered left, you know, left, left to their own devices. But he said, I can, I can do something about it. So he started out by buying them six saris. He found six widows that he could help. Many years later, and I can't confirm the, the number, but it's well over 600 widows that he buys a sari for every single birthday, December 24th, his gift to these people who have otherwise been forgotten. Mission Outreach Offering is our opportunity to, to get in behind these heroes, these people who do the mahi, you know, the real work. Uh, not that we don't do the real work, but I'm just saying these are the ones that do work that we wouldn't even imagine for, that we get to step towards. And as Jesus goes on and he keeps talking about the Samaritan, he goes and explains some things that the Samaritan does. And he says that the Samaritan let down and 
He poured oil upon the wounds. And you and I, we have the opportunity. We've got the good oil. We've got what the Bible calls the anointing, the anointing oil, the oil that heals people. What we do heals people. Who we are heals people. And Jesus says it this way, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon us, church. For he's anointed us, church, to bring the good news to the poor. He has anointed us, church, to comfort the brokenhearted. He has anointed us, church, to proclaim freedom to the captives and to the prisoners. And he's anointed us to tell mourners that the time of the Lord's favor has come. We have hope. We have the good oil. We've got the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon us. The Samaritan, he says, he disinfected the man's wound. He poured wine. Wine is such a a precious commodity, like a selfless act of love that the Samaritan poured out towards this Jew who was not even the same of the same tribe. And true love is known by the action that it prompts. It's more than just a feeling, church. And I, I got this letter from... Tess, Tess, stand up for a moment. This is Tess. Tess in 2018 was found in hospital. But there's a problem because she had signed up for a missions trip to Mexico to pour out some of that good wine, that love that's in her. And she wrote this letter to me and I, and I didn't know that she, she, in fact, she came up to me and said, did you not get the letter that I wrote to you even before I put this message together? I said, no, I didn't because she sent it to a, a wrong address. I said, please send it to me. And I read through it with tears, and I, I want to read it to you this morning, because this is what the, the good wine, the love that, that we have prompts us to do. It says, in April 2018, North Shore Hospital made me sign a waiver that if anything happened to me in Mexico, they would not be liable for me. But I was persistent to get to the people of Mexico. I was in the hospital for eight consecutive days. They have removed something in my pancreas. My hemoglobin blood was so low. The doctors had a meeting and they allowed me to go to Mexico, provided I signed the waiver. I had a dream while I was in hospital. My dream is that I was in a very dark house. And when I went inside and into the kitchen, there were two ladies and they greeted me and they knew my name. Then I also saw myself digging and planting plants around. I asked the Lord, what was my dream about? And he said, the house represents the people that you're about to meet in Mexico that don't know Jesus. And they were in darkness. God wanted me there because the people knew my name. You know, you can tell I'm going to cry every time I, you know, it's the heart of Jesus. They already knew my name. He said the digging, the planting was praying for these people and leading them to Christ. Pastor Greg assigned me to the admin of the medical team because of my condition and assigned me to light duties. He put me on to greet the people and show them to our City Impact Church doctors like Dr. Lees and Dr. Mike and Steph and a few of the other medical team that were over there with us. He put me in to, to greet them. And once they were given the medicine, to say goodbye and thank them for coming. But the Lord wanted more. He wanted me to pray and share Jesus with them. So I started sharing Jesus with them. And they started accepting Jesus. Over the 10 days that we were on mission, it was recorded between the team that 350 people, men, women, and children in Mexico, gave their heart to Jesus. Love is known by the action that it prompts. And God made a way for me to go to Mexico despite my condition because He loves these people. You and I get to pour out love, the good wine into people's wounds. Finally, Jesus says about the Samaritan, he put him on the donkey, took him into the inn, and then he covered the bill. The scripture 
that we hinge our missions outreach efforts upon, both internationally and locally. And even, you know, there's some people in our church that have come up to us and said, you know, can we help some families in our own church even uh, come to the schools that we're providing? This is all part of our missions outreach internationally, locally. We all have a part to play as a, ch- uh, as a church family to helping these people. And it's found in Proverbs 3.27. It says, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to help them. We have an opportunity to pick up the bill. We have an opportunity to fast and pray next week. Can I encourage you as your campus pastor, can we do this together this Missions Month? Can we all play a part in sidestepping towards the need instead of sidestepping away from the need this mission outreach time? Imagine, imagine for a moment, you, you heard Pastor Bishnu's story about a whole village that came to Christ because he stepped out in faith and prayed for a person who everybody else had left for dead. Can you imagine the ripple effect of what will happen next week as heaven looks down and sees City Impact Church gathering together in such great unity to help these people that we don't even know? I wonder if you can see the ripple effect. I wonder if you can see the lives that will be changed. I wonder if you see the people who will be healed. I wonder if you see the churches that will be planted. I wonder if you can see the medical centers that will be built in remote areas that will have to walk four to five hours to get medical help otherwise. I wonder if you can see what we see. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. If you want to watch more videos from us, I would recommend one of these. And don't forget to subscribe and turn the notification bell on to hear more from us at City Impact Church. God bless you.